Hi everyone, it's MJ the Fellow Actuary and in this video I want to talk about credit risk management, a very, very popular exam question. So we're going to be looking at 10 ways to manage credit risk. And the first one is probably the most obvious one, and that is to require some sort of collateral. So this tends to be with private debt. You lend somebody some money and you say, I'm only going to lend you this money if, if I can tie one of your assets to this loan so that if you fail to repay it, I can then take ownership of an asset that belongs to you. Tends to be the house, could be a car, could be something else with, with porn stars. Um, and if you guys have ever watched that show, some people will come in and they will pawn a fancy watch or some sort of antique as a form of collateral to get their loan. Now, collateral is very, very effective because when somebody says, okay, hold on, if I don't repay this loan, I'm gonna lose my house. They're gonna do their utmost best to make sure that they do not default on that loan. So when there's collateral, we tend to see a lower default rate. Also, if a default does occur, you can go take that asset and sell it, and that is going to improve your recovery rate, which means we're gonna see the severity of the risk lower as well. Of course, the big difficulty is that this asset tends to have low marketability because if it was a very marketable asset, then instead of them loaning it to uh, using it as collateral, they would have liquidated the asset and rather just use the money without having to come to you for credit. But because it tends to have low marketability, it means that they can use it as collateral, but if the bank or whoever's lending the money needs to liquidate it, they have to tend to do it at a below market price. Another big problem with collateral is that it requires a legal framework. So one of the things about, let's say, doing a loan over the internet, if you lend money to somebody in another country and they don't uh, repay it and you say, okay, I'm going to come take your house, um, they can say, well, try. If, if, you know, if there's not that legal structure in place, then it's gonna be very difficult to collect. So collateral is very effective, but it does require a legal system in order for it to be enforced. Now, another way for, say, public debt or for how, how organizations can deal with large amounts of credit risk, so think of a bank that's lent money to a whole bunch of people, how do they now manage it after the fact, they can do something called securitization. This is where you create a special purpose vehicle or an SPV, um, and this allows you to transfer the risk off your balance sheet. So what you do is you give all the loans to the special purpose vehicle, and they then give you um, ownership of that special purpose vehicle. And essentially what you're doing through this accounting exercise is you're converting credit risk to market risk. And with the original Basel Accords, they were only looking at credit risk. This became a form of regulatory arbitrage and it allowed you to basically bypass regulations and hold lower capital because of the way you had structured it. But another big advantage of securitization is because you've moved it off the balance sheet to another separate entity, you can then sell that entity or shares in that entity on the capital markets and you can then actually offload a lot of your credit exposure um, if there is a buyer. And what tended to happen with the financial crisis is that because China had devalued its currency and was buying lots of American treasury bonds, the American treasury bonds have, had come so low that your big pension funds and other institutions were trying to seek yield in weird and wonderful places. And so they started you know, buying into these mortgage-backed securities. Um, but that is a story for, for another day. Um, another thing with credit risk management is to have a two-team approach. You've got the front office and you've got the back office. And here the big idea is to realize that companies, or especially banks, want to expose themselves to credit risk. Why? Because that's how they make quite a lot of money. 
A bank makes money, think about it. If someone deposits money and they pay them 5% interest, but they can lend that money out to somebody else and they can get 10% interest, then they're making a very juicy spread. So banks want to be exposed to credit risk, specifically when your frequency of default is very, very low. So what they'll tend to do is they'll sometimes have a front office which tries to sell loans. So somebody will call in and say, hey, I need $20,000 in order to buy this truck. Then you could even have an instance where the salesman at the bank or someone working at the bank says, hey, listen, why don't I've checked your records? You know, you've got a very good history. Um, you've got a good salary. Why don't I lend you 25,000 and you buy the better version of the truck or you use the money to, I don't know, um, buy yourself something pretty at the same time. And then what tends to happen is to try and prevent the front office from just going too crazy and handing out too much money, you'll then have the back office that then actually says, okay, hold on, can the person take 25,000? Okay, yes, they'll do the check and we'll look at some of the models that they will incorporate that the back office does. Of course, um, there's the classic example where the incentive structures of these two offices can sometimes cause them to be in conflict. And the classic example is when the front office is paid a bonus on the amount of loans they issue and the back office is penalized by the amount of defaults that they experience. Because then what happens is front office goes crazy and throws loans to people who don't deserve it or who, who can't afford it and back office is is saying, well, hold on, um, there's so much work for us to do and we're just going to get penalized that they just start blanketly declining everyone because they're still going to get paid their amount, their salary is based on defaults, not necessarily on volume. So it's very important that if you go with the two-team approach, you design the incentive structure in a way that is complementary and doesn't conflict your operations. Then, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, diversification is always a valid way of managing risk. Um, and how you can diversify is through different types of loans. There's loans for starting businesses, there's loans for mortgages, there's different, there's student debt, there's, there's lots and lots of different types of loans. I mean, even credit cards. So you can diversify by type. You can also diversify by region. If you're an international bank, you know, lend here in South Africa, lend a little bit in America, lend a little bit in Australia. Um, and then another idea with diversification is you can make lots and lots of small loans uh, so imagine like you got lots and lots of small loans with your capital that you have instead of a few big ones. So it's just also having a different strategy on what part of the market you want to access. Of course, diversification does fall flat when we're in a bit of a pand pandemic situation like with the coronavirus or when there's a big recession and everyone around the world just starts defaulting at the same time. So diversification is not bulletproof but it is always going to be a valid uh, management technique in the exam, but maybe even mention a little bit of its downside or when it will be ineffective. Then when it comes to credit risk management, don't forget to mention the soft approaches. Um, anyone who's been a little bit behind in their, their mortgage repayments will, will probably know quite a few more than these, but essentially sending letters to uh, people reminding them that they have payments, sometimes just putting a little bit of pressure or just saying, hey, listen, you need to repay me, is enough to get people to, to start repaying their, their loans. In an extreme situation, you could send a debt collector. This is normally a very large person who is intimidating, um, although you kind of think of the movies, they, they don't really have baseball bats and break your legs, um, like, you know, in, like I said, in some of those gangster movies, but they will kind of intimidate and maybe say, hey, um, you need to actually make the payment or you could be more forgiving create a grace period restructure the terms maybe say instead of repaying the, the, the amount within the next 10 years you can repay it over the next 20 years so there are various soft approaches that you can take in order to prevent a default from occurring um, like I say there's quite a lot of soft approaches so make sure you read up and expose yourself to quite a few of them 
Then there's hedging, um, specifically let's say your credit model says, okay, well, a 1% increase in interest rate is going to cause a 3% increase in default rates. Um, this is because especially if it's, a, if it's an adjustable mortgage and uh, interest rates increase, maybe some people are, are unable to pay that extra amount and therefore they will default. So what you can do is you can say, okay, let's maybe use a, a, a financial instrument such as an interest rate swap that allows us to therefore make money when the interest rate increases and we can use that additional gains to hedge the losses from the defaults that we would experience. So this is kind of where interest rates can, can, can come in. And I mean, interest rates are a, sw uh, are a form of derivative. You could be a little bit more direct with your der derivatives by using credit default swaps. Um, which, you know, it's not really a swap, it's more a form of insurance, but they called it a swap in order to bypass insurance regulations. We won't go there right now. Uh, but you can use these credit defaults to change your risk profile. And what's quite nice is you can use it also to increase your credit risk exposure. Remember, banks want this risk. Yes, it's, it's bad if someone doesn't pay, but if they do pay, banks make money. And if they feel like they've got a really good book, they might call up and say, let's have a credit default swap where they can actually magnify or leverage their exposure on their own um, book, or they could even do it on, on other people's books. So you can actually get exposure, credit risk exposure, without having to go through the whole hassle of setting up face-to-face -face meetings or, or having models or having a bank, you can use these instruments to change your risk profile to how you want it to be. Um, what you can also do is buy and sell loan books. We saw this during, just before the financial recession, the big banks, what they were doing is going around to the smaller mortgage um, originators and just buying all their books from them. Of course, that caused a big problem because then those um, smaller companies had no incentive to implement any form of risk management. So where people had to say what their job was, they just left it blank. Um, they just wanted to you know, throw out these loans because they could then offload it to the bigger institutions who then chopped it up into mortgage-backed securities, who then threw it onto somebody else. And this is kind of where the whole um, crisis of 2008 um, stemmed from. But what you can do if you feel like you've got too much credit risk, you could sell a chunk of your book, um, or you could, if you want more, go to another company and buy their book. Of course, this is a more complicated trade. It's not necessarily something you can do on a, on a market. This will normally be a, a deal uh, between two institutions that tend to have maybe a good relationship one another. Look, you can also uh, manage your credit risk at the start. You can have stricter underwriting requirements. So before, if you had, oh, you needed the person to be earning so much excessive income, now you could increase that proportion. You could maybe say, we're only going to be um, lending money to, to app trees and people with financial degrees. Anybody else, we're just going to tell them, no, they're too risky. So you can change your underwriting requirements. You could increase the amount of collateral that they want to hold. You know, there's lots of different things that you can can do at the underwriting stage and then finally um, you can also dispose of public debt as soon as it becomes um, it well as soon as it loses its investment grade status so instead of buying a bond and holding it for this whole duration and if the credit starts deteriorating your rate of default goes up and maybe to an uncomfortable um, area you could always tap out of course selling out means you're going to incur a little bit of uh, a little bit of a loss so it, it depends very much on your strategy and your appetite for credit risk um, but yeah, as soon as let's say you only want investment grade as soon as selling loses investment grade and goes into the b's then you can say, okay, let's dispose it, take that loss on, on the chin. So like I said, there's various ways on how to manage your credit risk. Um, these are just 10 ways. Like I say, for this exam, you maybe want to come up with a few more on your own and just add it to your own notes. But this should get you off to a very good start.